Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Night Light. A reminder that you are never alone. Welcome to Nightlight, everybody. Thank you so much for sharing your afternoon, evening, or morning, depending on where you are in the world, with us. Mark has an amazing show put together today with with artists and mu musicians um, that, that are phenomenal, whose, whose names, fr frankly, aren't really familiar to me, but anybody who's into music, they are familiar to. He's done an amazing job of not only pulling together the, al the creator of this amazing album we're going to be talking about, but we have clips of some of the musicians and how they have um, seen and experienced UFOs. It's a whole new slant on the UFO experience, and it's amazing and interesting and fascinating. So I'm going to turn the show over to Mark. Mark, the platform is yours. Take it away. Okay. How are you, Barbara? You having a Doing good weekend? Well. So far, good. so good. 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 Okay. Yeah. This, uh, this is a rarity. I'm I'm kicking off the week. Yes, you are. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's going to be a milestone week for uh, Night Lights. Um, you know, we are your cure for football withdrawal, uh, <laughs> and we have three uh, music-themed shows this week, and a book review uh, later in the week too. So um, it, it, it's we have a lot of unique stuff lined up for everyone uh you know we also have new guests with whom we are working for the first time other friends have new projects that are about to be released and you know we thank them for letting light light uh be one of the first shows to promote their exciting projects and our special Absolutely. guest today is right it's it's an honor for them to uh, give us uh I'm one of the first shots of getting the word out about uh, the new book, the uh, new CD. So, and uh, our, our special guest today is Joanna Summerscales. Uh, she co-authored 44 with Bill Brooks, and that book explores uh, Bill's lifelong ET abductions. Uh, Joanna is the founder of the etnewsroom.com. Uh, she is an artist and a regression therapist. Um, Joanna is also the producer and one of the artists on the widely acclaimed new CD, Eclectia. Uh, today and Tuesday's uh, shows, uh, Tuesday we'll, you know, we'll have uh, Merle Fankhauser as our guest, uh, we'll, we'll be covering this compilation of international artists' UFO ET themed music. So, you know, I just want to uh, welcome Joanna uh, to Nightlight. How, how are you today? Hey, thank you very much, uh, Barbara and Mark, for having me on. And 
thank you for showcasing Eclectia. I think you probably are the first since it's been released, which is just at the end of November, to uh, to flag it up. So thank you so much. And it is really uh, exciting. And uh, it is that, uh, you know, it's a world first as well. Something totally uh-huh. unique in this incredible field that we're all plugging into. It, it's it, it really is a terrific CD, and and how how did you get involved with you know ETs and UFOs and how did oh, that lead one. yeah how how did you lead or did 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 that lead you into being the producer of this two CD series. Okay, well, you know what? We could talk for about six or seven hours about that, but yep. I'll try and I'll try and encapsulate it. So, um, so I don't know. I've always been interested in consciousness, health, and wellness. That's why I did this regression work. And you know, I was uh, quite astonished to have a couple of clients in my earlier days. This is about twenty, twenty-five years ago, who uh, reported independent of one another that they'd both had uh, ET experiences and this was freaking them out because neither of them uh, was into the subject or aware of it, but was um, you know, pretty uh, unnerved by what they were seeing. One gentleman saw himself in, embodied as a gray and an explosion of a planet and that he had come to take on uh, life um, in a different format, which was the human body. And he had no sense of timing or time scale on this, but um, the trauma of that loss and the change and all of that was what we worked with. And then the other gentleman would, yeah, I'm kind of smiling because, you know, how many of us get up in the night, you know, to go to the bathroom and, you know, you might be washing your hands and there's the mirror of the bathroom cabinet and suddenly the same for him, uh, but he wouldn't see his face looking back. He would see that of some ET. And I believe it was a gray if my memory serves me right. And, and <laughs> it was as real as real could be for him. And so he too really wanted to explore that and get to the bottom. And it seemed too there seemed to be um, an action some activity which involved that, which again, a lot of people, if they don't have, if they don't have an interest in the field, um, are are very shocked and surprised. I mean, not unlike Bill Brooks, whom you mentioned, who for 44 years would think people like you and I were complete fruitcakes. Should we ever mention anything about this subject from ETs to UFOs? He'd think that either we'd been at, at the booze or that we were ready for, you know, some medication. <laughs> So imagine what a shock it can be for people, say like Bill, not everybody's has died in the wall uh, like Bill, you know, did not absolutely believe and, you know, uh, all of that. But when he did have a download experience at age 44, which is why that number appears in the title, uh, what was because he actually thought he'd had some kind of mental breakdown, some kind of psychosis suddenly popping up in his life. And uh, and and he hit bottle. He's he he doesn't mind admitting for a good two years to try and come to terms with it because back in that time, which would have been he's in his um, late sixties now, born in 1950. Um, so back when he was 44, which isn't that long ago, where are we? 94. Um, he, the, people weren't really talking about abductees in the way that things happened to him. It was a little bit more of the um, love and light, and nothing wrong with that, except that wasn't his experience. He he had really uh, intense experiences, and when he turned 44, during one occasion, he he was a professional musician as well, and he was back from a gig around 2 a.m., sat down to relax and analyze his, his uh, gig performance, all the rest of that. Well, he began to see strange things, the wall undulating, changing configuration with something that he would say looked like hieroglyphics there and grays and then suddenly this his it's like his brain opened up or something opened it up and it was like an NDE experience in as much as his whole life played out before him and what he never believed in was shown him in full technicolor and that was since from about the age of two or three he had been taken and 
Bill never had regression. He said during those 20 odd years, because he first contacted, contacted me in about 2012. And the reason for that was because he's also ex-military and had some experiences in the military. Interestingly, at um, uh, when he'd come out of the uh, training, he went straight to Senelaga, Germany, on a base shared with personnel from, I mean, honestly, you couldn't make this story up, from Area 51. And it was a nuclear base. So he was taxed also with signing, um, you know, Security Act, Secret Act, all the rest of that kind of paperwork. And he and his lot were not allowed to associate or fraternize with the Americans. Very interesting stuff. Um, but he experienced some very bizarre things happening, including um, a, a, obviously a military orientated UFO style kind of abduction, except in Germany, that one was at gunpoint. This was an interesting take on it. The others were not. And um, in 2012, I said he'd had a series of heart attacks and strokes and just wanted someone who understood. And having heard my um, interview with uh, a wounded soldier, ex uh, special forces from the UK, on his experiences, he thought, well, you know, I'm sure that maybe here for the first time I could get a, a, a safe, unjudgmental hearing. And that's really why I set the ET newsroom up, which was formerly the Amash Project, because I realized in the UK specifically, there's lots of places it seems in the US, but in the UK, there wasn't really a focal point where people could call in. Cause I've got a dedicated number, mobile number, and um, feel safe and secure that, uh, you know, and they didn't have to go on the record in, a, you know, go public with me if they didn't want. But I was also looking to record this. And because I think this is important, a very, very important social documenting that we're doing here, you know, uh -huh. it may be entertaining and all the rest of that, but it's very important. And so during all of this sort of time leading up to 2011, when I started the Amash project, um, I, I had interviewed and been around Sixto Paz Wells, who some of you may know is the Peruvian um, contactee who has had for many, many years now, since he was 17, uh, contact with extraterrestrials, been through portals or Zendras, and, and, he t and has been involved with the Rama group, um, uh, very much like a C-SETI, except it has a, a, a very deep spiritual foundation to it. Uh, so anyway, so my 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 interest was peaked to say the least, and because I'm just the type of person I am, I was pretty open to to things, and ex and because I have disability in my family as well, and I just wanted to explore things. Of course, that takes you into different realms of consciousness. Hence, with you know regression, though I wouldn't actually call it strict regression work now, although it can take you down that story field. It's it's more like a quantum healing because it's going to those points of inception where there is disruption or blocks or whatever, lesions in the field and dealing with it. And you don't always need the story these days, but it's okay if some people do. It just depends what their soul need is on that in that regard. So it, it was just quite interesting. And then I did a little bit of work with a, an English guy called Andrew Johnson, who's done a fantastic amount of work on the 9-11 with Dr. Judy Wood, who I think is absolutely incredible. And I got to interview her. She is definitely one of my heroines in coming forward. Uh, if people don't know her and her book, it's called uh, Where Did the Towers Go? Phenomenal piece of uh, research work. Anyway, so all of that. So it's not just strictly the ET, it's the wider field, uh, you know, very deeply interested in the um, technology side of it, because um, I w did some work with uh, John Searle, who sadly died just uh, the other side of Christmas, and he is a gentleman, for those who may not know, who created right back from the 40s, he was in his late 80s, I think, when he died, um, an anti-gravity device uh, and oh. there is a wonderful documentary called uh, I think it's called The Life of John Searle by Bradley Lockerman and excellent material and very very interesting so uh, and of course you know all of this we see this kind of different technology with ET craft 
and clearly they have some technology um, you know in healing as well there's been lots of healings and other things that have happened to people but it's you know there is another perhaps not one more but many layers to the consciousness aspect to the accessing our elements of our brain that we have not you know we're just coming into understanding how to tap into that clearly most of those other intelligent or all of the other intelligences that interact with us seem to have you know got a handle on and uh, so all of this is a huge field so I'm interested in creating bridges creating dialogue creating a safe place you know this subject as you know is absolutely open to ridicule and infiltration by those who would uh, tear it down and you know create disinfo and you know that's just par for the course with this field and you know I've had my experience of that too but moving on through the Amash project it it was you know I feel it's a privilege I really do to be trusted with the work and with the experiences of these people and to for them to come forward and then to allow me to share their story and to share it uh, honestly is, uh, you know, is really something. And it takes, I have to tell you, a great deal of courage for those who think this is easy to come forward and speak your truth when it is something so left of field for, for the majority of the human race. And I'll say majority as far as we know though <laughs> there are plenty of people having these experiences, but still, so sort of coming fast forward, um, the ETN, the ET newsroom or ETN got born because again, um, I've been, I've had impedances of a psychic nature and physical nature all the way through, especially since I started um, the Amash project which have uh, endeavoured to either scare me off or stop me doing what I'm doing. And the MASH website, suddenly, um, the guy who'd been helping me with the back end of it, a lovely gentleman called Tony Hurst, who's involved now with uh, working with the um, the CBD oil and all those uh, other elements mm-hmm. to help us all, said, Joanne, there's a problem. And people had been alerting me to the fact that when they'd gone to the ET newsroom, website that they were coming up with these big red flashes of danger danger I thought well what the heck's happening here and anyway he said oh my god Joanne your website has been piggybacked and is being uh, accessed by a gazillion porn sites a minute I mean and he showed me real time the uh, links all going through and then he said, I didn't think it, you had a subscription site. And, and I, I haven't, and I hadn't at the time. And I said, I don't. He said, well, you've got a lot of subscribers to all this. <laughs> so I said, okay, save the web, save the material. If we can just shut it, shut it right now. I couldn't possibly have the pollution of the ethers. I mean, each to their own, you know. It sounds like I'm making a judgment call about porn, and I am for myself. I think it's awful, but, you know, each to their own, as I say, and I didn't want it coming through any work or space that I'm involved in. So um, that's how the ET Newsroom got born, because I had to very quickly come up with a name so I could keep the ball rolling. Um, And I'll just say that with ETN, it's just I'm just doing perhaps a lot more than I would have done before with the Amash project, which was focusing only on the experience. So now I'm I'm doing um, quite a lot a lot more besides like the wonderful wonderful eclectia so eclectia got born because i don't know around about 2015 i'd been thinking about the my so my background just to give you a quick thing was why why i would be interested in the media kind of thing because my training was in theater TV, some production, some acting, voice work, that kind of thing. Um, production I really love. And, and so I've, I've written a musical called Fifth Dimension, which is still waiting for its glory days, <laughs> a couple of which of the songs appear on the album for fun. And, and then I had been thinking about this musical component. I'm not a musician or a singer, but I adore a lot of music. And I could, and you know, just knowing that so many had had experiences, and then with Grant Cameron's work, 
and over the years, you know, we'd exchange emails and we'd be talking about all of this. And I thought, I, you know, I have to do this somehow. Anyway, that idea was playing around in my mind for quite a while until last year, uh, around about December or January, I was contacted by uh, an experiencer and musician called Dougie Degnin, who said, look, um, I- I've got some free time. He, he was on, he, he uh, was not very well, so he'd, you know, he was on, he had time, even though he didn't have uh, much else. And he said, I would love to just be involved as volunteer with your work. I think it's great what you're doing. And um, when we met up and when I realized he was a musician and not only that, a singer songwriter, worked, still was doing band work and all the rest of that, I said, listen, what do you think about coming on board and helping me birth this fantastic project? And he just went, oh, my God, that would be amazing. <laughs> and so and so we did. We began the journey. And um, through my own radio show, uh, The Amash Files, some, some years back, and uh, some of the contacts I'd make and also other people had for me, we just sourced these people. And Meryl Fankhauser, well, you know, he'd been a guest on my radio show before, and he was so lovely. He was such a positive influence and so enthusiastic about the idea. And and he headlines Eclectia for me with his fantastic oh. song, Calling from a Star. And maybe we can play that sometimes so people can can hear oh. that. And And... Anyway, I, I just, it, it came together and it came together in equal parts. So US, Canada and, and uh, the UK, of course. And as it grew, I, I know the power of the voice and I wanted the experiences, the musicians to bring in their little vignette, the little snapshot of as much as they could, put it into one or two minutes, just to, to give us a flavor of what had happened for them or to just give us a sound from them in the orientation of what their music was about. And that's what happened. And then I also had been speaking with Chris Bledsoe. Now he's uh, become quite well known in the experience of field. And of course, his story is... Where'd she go? I didn't... Mark, are you still there? It was... Yeah, I'm Mark. I'm still here. You, uh, oh, okay, did you did I inter- get interrupted there? Yeah, uh, just for uh, two seconds. Oh, okay. Sorry about it. I don't know what that was? But um, I, and he, we. It was one of those occasions when it seemed like everything technologically was was trying to stop us speaking. And because of time constraints, it had to be the time. But bless him, even after two hours of difficulty, he still stayed with it. And on the uh, album, we have his, uh, we've, it's very much cut down and it's not great audio, but it's the only one that's not great. But I put it there because we have his voice and he, you can hear it if you listen a few times to it, really exactly what he's saying. But he was talking about how he'd been asked to give a message to Grant, who had no interest in music. Uh, from this lady who Chris said, if I could express the look of her as anything religiously, I'd say she looks like Mother Mary. And she was introduced to him by, I think, the Greys. And he said, but also she could be any of the Dianas, the heroes, the, the divine feminine coming through. And absolutely said, Joanne, I'm telling you, if there's a God, she's a woman. And when I just <laughs> did a little laugh, he said, no, I'm serious. He said, I really mean it. But this wonderful presence said to him that Grant should have this message, and it involved the phrase that the message is in the music. And I had already started working on the album, um, and when I knew that, I said, oh, my God, we've got to get Grant talking about his book, Tuned In, The Paranormal Influence on Music, and you know all of this. So it was very exciting. So the album became kind of educational and entertainment. So there's one or two little interviews, and then there's a wonderful commentary of a John Martin letter, which he very bravely and courageously allowed me to share with all you guys, the world, on the album, which was a private letter that he let me have sight of initially, which is telling the President Jimmy Carter about his experiences because they'd had occasion to chat about UFOs and Jimmy Carter was an aficionado of classical guitar and I don't know how they got hooked up there but so they had this relationship and uh, were speaking about it so 
I don't know whether Barbara wants to share any of that now or you, Mark, or a little yeah, bit later. Yeah, uh, mm-hmm. you know, maybe, maybe we ought to uh, j- just take a break and play one of these uh, s- sound bites. Uh, do you uh, want to go with I got the, Grant? Yeah, I've got the that. I've got the John Martin letter. If she'd like that. Uh, okay, we we we, were, we we just stopped with that one. Uh, do you, uh, how about we play that and we'll get a sample of how this phenomenon has uh, been studied by a president? Okay, so John Martin letter, right? That's good. Yes. Okay. It is fascinating. John Martin, classical guitarist, composer, and arranger, who features on the E.T. album Eclectia, has given me permission to share some of the contents of a private letter, as I thought you too would find this of interest. This letter was the result of some correspondence between John and President Jimmy Carter when they'd had occasion to speak about UFOs. This was... President Carter's response to John's account, he says, John, thanks for the CDs, photos, and the wonderful account. Best wishes, Jimmy Carter. John writes, as a musician for nearly the past 50 years, I can share with you and with great confidence, music is the universal language. In 2013, I made the conscious effort to perform music with the intent of projecting positive thoughts and musical works into the universe. On only my second session of performing classical, baroque, romantic, impressionist and original works on classical guitar out of my deck, and again with a conscious thought of projecting music, positive thought, peace and love into the universe, an incredible event occurred. A purple, bell-shaped, luminous craft with a pink rotating ring circling outside the bottom third of the bell, silently floated directly above our home. All the alarms in the house, including the refrigerator, were going off. A surge protector on my musical equipment began smoking. My significant other saw the craft with me as it slowly crossed over us and then disappeared behind the tree line. It was at an altitude of no more than a couple of hundred feet above us. It was breathtaking. A few days later, four craft, in two sets of two and in a perfect line, were silently spinning above our courtyard. A few days after that, the big ones came. John also describes another interesting phenomena which occurred after an immense cross-shaped and crescent-shaped UFO flew over his courtyard. There was a projection into his mind that he would have something to photograph soon. And within 10 days, a large heart-shaped cloud appeared over his property. And in fact, over time, there have been more of these heart-shaped clouds that have appeared as if in response and appreciation of his energies being sent out into the universe. Toward the end of the letter, John goes on to say, As a religious person, I feel these experiences are more correctly interpreted as universal in nature as opposed to a religious experience. I think that's really quite an astonishing account. And Mm -hmm. when you hear John's account as well in his own small soundbite, he actually also does some of this communicating telepathically, completely telepathically. That is, he won't have his guitar in his hand, his physical guitar, but he will be doing all the work mentally, sending out the same songs or, 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 and alongside this love and appreciation. And he just said it's extraordinary, the response he's had. So I think that's kind of interesting. I haven't heard of anybody doing that specifically, but one of the um, other musicians, um, Kevin Estrella, who's up in Canada there, was saying that on from 2014, he'd had, I think he called it an inter, interdimensional craft. You'll hear it on his 
soundbite if I sent you that one. And it, it's really extraordinary. And he says now he's in regular contact. I mean, by weekly contact and maybe even more frequent than that. And they're working with him to create music telepathically through him. I mean, this is so, so wonderful. And all the people on the album, th there's many genres of styles of music. Uh -huh. And the genre is uh, actually in the person because the criteria for appearing on the album was that either you, you had to have had you know, profound one-to-one -one contact or some encounter or profound sightings which changed your life. But this could include the paranormal and spiritual, which would all be kind of linked with the field. And, you know, that is, that is absolutely everybody. Uh, Joanna, do you feel... That a validation from a president makes the case for the vision for Eclectia? Well, um, I, well, the case, um, I, I don't know if you mean that the case is that this is valid because here we are, we've got an album and these are the musicians presenting their music and their sound bites and that, that, that it must be real because, uh, of course not, because look, we have the Right Honourable Paul Hellyer, who since his retirement has been uh, talking, you know, over the Canadian ex-Minister uh, of Defence has uh -huh. been talking openly and loudly about the reality of, of UFOs. So, you know, we can say, does, does, that, does that give credibility? Well, I, I think it gives credibility in some people's eyes, and uh, it, it's not that it, it, Jimmy Carter's comments take away from it. It's just that it seems to me that we need uh, Joe Public or every man public and woman <laughs> to understand the reality of this. And it's not whether you, that you have experiences. You, to have this, you don't have to have had experiences, but simply have an open mind and realize there's a lot more going on than, than we know. But for some people, that will certainly be a validation. And, you know, he had his own sighting. Jimmy Carter's sighting is well known mm -hmm. and documented. And it's also known, you know, that he, he asked for access to, you know, files and was denied them as other presidents have been denied them. So um, it's interesting, though, and it's interesting that, um, you know, John was able to have discussion with, you know, with him about this and, and share it. Um, and, it, you know, I think it's very brave of John. It took a little while for him to consider whether this would be a good thing to share with, with people because, of course, uh, Jimmy Carter has... A, his family, and he just didn't want any repercussions of a negative kind filtering down in that direction. But I think he's, uh, you know, so much on the record as, you know, having seen it and that documented very well that um, hopefully that's not going to be an issue. And, and how did so many of these other artists come to your attention? Um, well, some of them had been on my own show. As I say, mm -hmm. John Martin had been on my show, my own radio show, The Imash Files. And uh, Steve Boucher, I got to know Steve Boucher through Grant Cameron. Steve Boucher is a woodwind player. He's up in, um, I think it's, I don't know, it's Hamilton or St. Catharines, uh, Canada as well. And, I mean, my goodness, his, his story is unbelievable. <laughs> it's unbelievably extraordinary. Uh, again, it as a youngster, just a quick overview, as a youngster, you know, he thinks that maybe 16 or 17 years old, he was doing a gig. Um, and uh, on the way back, uh, they, <laughs> they encountered a UFO. And as events unfolded, the UFO set down. And their little van that they were traveling in with all their kit, uh, the door was um, opened by somebody from the inside. But they were escorted to the craft. And all of them, all of the, the now how the, you know that's pretty unusual that um, you know the whole band was taken and also down the down the line if you listen to his story he's got a, a couple of lots of interviews out there now but uh, only in recent times uh, but it's fantastic to hear this story mm -hmm. and he was also saying that um, uh, an audience was also um, taken at one point and it, what's really interesting when you look at 
what's coming out of all of these interactions is that for the person, it's an incredible life-changing event. Uh, even if you're open to it, it, the fact that it changes your consciousness, your thinking, and the way you perceive the world is an absolute fact. And that is a, a very interesting thing that I'm interested in because then it seems to me that many people who've had experiences also mm -hmm. develop um, an added aspect or facet of their ability to do their creative uh, nature of their work. Sorry, that there's, I was just trying to couch it in different terms because some people if, who are not creative, but they've uh, got other faculties. For example, one person I spoke to some years ago said that he seemed to have, um, and, and wasn't a big person, an incredible degree of stamina to the point where in his job, which required some physical work, even as a small person, he could almost get the work done of two other people himself in such a short period of time but it was like a phenomenon and he and it was it was noticed so different and that may sound an odd thing but it it is just something that maybe the makeup of of having a lot of interaction with et um released some ability to have that incredible degree of stamina other people have an incredible explosion of creativity and uh, musical downloads and as Grant has described in his work and uh, lectures, and Michael Luckman, who was the author of Alien Rock, spoke uh -huh. about these incredible stories of musicians having encounters. They also facilitated sometimes an instant download of some of the world's most famous songs. And they all say, it wasn't me, it just came. And it, it's really fascinating absolutely amazing how that right brain right brain midbrain which is the miracle brain part of us the pineal gland area it clearly gets activated and stimulated and that remains and what also is interesting is the character of a person sorry you wanted to say something oh it, yeah you're leading into a segue into Grant's uh, Grant Cameron's uh, uh, sound bite that oh that's interesting yeah it, 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 yeah it, it's a perfect segue and it, you know, all the creativity you're discussing uh, it, uh, you, you know, we need to get that one ready to play and uh, shortly be, because this is uh, really fascinating about the creative process after seeing a, a UFO or you know, having a paranormal experience. Okay, yeah, it's all indeed. it's all up Absolutely. and ready to go. Okay, want me to play it? Uh, okay. Yeah, sure. Why, uh, why not? This is uh, jo Joanna just led us into it. I have to thank Grant Cameron for joining me this evening and to talk about Eclectia. Eclectia being this album, which features experiences, musicians, singer-songwriters, all who have had some kind of incredible contact or some kind of profound sighting which has completely changed how they think about life. And that has impacted their songs, their creativity. Grant, you've not long published a book called Tuned In, but I think it's the paranormal influence on music. Yeah, it's called Tuned In, the Paranormal World of Music. That's it. And it's um, basically started a couple of years ago when I got a phone call from the very prominent experiencer, Chris Bledsoe. He phoned me to tell me he deals with the beings that he's dealing with. He calls them the guardians. And he said, I've got a message here for you from the Guardians. Because I'd already had a bizarre experience with him at his house, I sort of knew that these things could happen. So basically, he told me the message they have for you is that the message is in the music. When he said that to me, that the message is in the music, I said, well, you might be talking to the wrong guy because I basically have never played music. I, I no musical ability. My whole family was musical. I don't listen to music. 
And then he said, well, you should listen to a song called Cashmere by Led Zeppelin. And I said, well, okay, Chris, but I still really not interested in music. And then it's sort of like the hook that gets you in. He said, or he had got the indication from them, that one of the songs that should be reviewed is Neil Young's After the Gold Rush. So when he said that, I said, Neil Young? Are you kidding? Neil Young is one of the people that you think is involved? And he said, yeah. And I live in a city called Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, and it's a place where even Canadians don't want to visit. It's a, a place where Neil Young Young grew up. And that's what got me. If it had not been for the fact that Neil Young was one of the people he mentioned, I never would have gotten down because I have no interest in this whatsoever. So I looked at the lyrics of the song after the goal rush, and it's basically this song where he talks about the bombed out world, almost like we're treating the world like a gold rush, and when the gold is gone, it's going to become a ghost town. And then he talks about the silver seeds, the, the flying saucers, the silver seeds will come, and they'll take the chosen ones with what Yvonne Smith calls the experiencers, the abductees. They're going to take the chosen ones to another planet. And this is, I believe it's in the Free Foundation shows that 39% of all experiencers have seen what's called the screen on board the ship. And yeah. it has the environmental images of destruction. This is basically what this After the Gold Rush song is about. So I was sort of hooked at that moment and I started to look at Neil Young and these songs and came across a book written by Michael Luckman called Alien Rock, which was written a number of years ago. And he was a producer in New York City, knew Michael Jackson and a number of other musicians. Uh, David Bowie's wife he knew very well and had put this entire book together, 330 pages of uh, all these musicians, the Beatles, the Stones, Elvis Presley, and he just went through one after another. And the, his synopsis of the book was that all these musicians had this bizarre interest in uh, UFO sightings, in studying UFOs. So I started to look at it. I was more interested in the messages. Why are musicians, what's going on here? Because I had gotten it from an experiencer angle. So that was when I started the book called Tuned In. And I suddenly realized that you had all these musicians that were having UFO sightings, just, I mean, absolute scores of them. And a number of them would then talk about their inspiration, how they were inspired to do music. And this is basically pretty much the experiencer line that there's 42% of all experiencers say at some point, or they have scientific, mathematical, technical material in their head that they did not learn in school. So it was a download thing that musicians were exhibiting. Uh, how many of them were experienced? There was a number of them that were clear experiencers, such as uh, Ace Fraley from the, the band Kiss, who basically talks about you know waking up in the doorway of his house and suddenly he gets this recollection that he's been on board a flying saucer and goes into the shower and checks his body for wound and then finds this 27-foot burn circle in his backyard. And it's these kind of bizarre stories when I started going through them. I was actually at one point so impressed that I thought the intelligence behind the UFO phenomena had every single musician. It was just so bizarre how you basically almost predict that there would be some sort of connection. And where that was confirmed to me was, I come from a city that has a number of famous musicians came out of it, like Neil Young, uh, the Crash Test Dummies. But the most famous one was the, the band The Guess Who, who wrote this very famous song called American Woman. And in the late 60s in Canada, we're actually out selling the Beatles. So I thought, well, I wonder if uh, Burton Cummings, the head of the band, had, whether he's been abducted. So I put in Burton Cummings and I put alien abduction and the screen just lit up and it went to his Facebook page. And here's Burton Cummings talking in, in caps. So he's yelling on his Facebook page, I'm 64 years old, I'll say whatever I want. I don't care what anybody thinks. And he starts talking about Whitney Strieber and how they're abusing Whitney Strieber. And I know exactly how he feels. And I'm going, wow. I mean, nobody on his Facebook would know who Whitney Strieber is. And yet, yeah, I just looked at it. And that's when I sort of got this idea. I said, I wonder if they've got every musician. And it went back to almost to what Chris Bledsoe said, was that there are these, there's a message in the music. And if you start looking at some of the lyrics in these songs, you suddenly realize that kids are singing them, you sing them, and you have no idea what the lyrics are about. When you actually start looking at them, you see all these UFO messages, messages about oneness, and you start picking up really bizarre stories where musicians actually say yes. Uh, for example, Mike Pinder from the band the, the Moody Blues says quite clearly that there are lyrics in there in the Moody Blues songs that did not come, they came from elsewhere. And then you go to Colin Andrews, the very, very famous crop circle guy who had five different bands come to him, very famous band who wanted to talk to them. And one of them was, was the Moody Blues. And the Moody Blues talk about Pinder and the lead guitarist were talking to Colin. And Colin said, you could tell they were not making this up. It was going back and forth as they, they told this story. 
about the fact that they remember before they were born and that they had been at a table with some sort of elders and they were told they were going to be musicians, they were going to go into the earth, they were going to put lyrics into songs, and they were going to do this sort of raising of the consciousness of the earth. And uh, then the lead guitar said, tell them how we came back in the earth. Tell them how that black hole, tell them how we came back in the earth. And you get these things that experiencers also talk about, this idea, number of musicians, one that comes pops into my mind is Steve Boucher, whose band was also entirely abducted in 1972. And Steve Boucher remembers before he was born, uh, being with the beings, standing on what he looked like the moon, and looking at the earth and being told that he had to go to the earth to do this sort of role. So it, I started down this thing and started looking at this connection to the musicians. And it was unbelievable. It's it just not only the UFO thing, but the paranormal aspects. 150 songs that came in dreams. And see, some of these are the biggest songs of all times. You know, they, like the Beatles, Yesterday, Paul McCartney, Let It Be was a song that Paul McCartney got. His, his mother came to him in a dream. Her name was Mary, and he was a very tough time for the Beatles. And he tells the story, the lyrics go, in times of trouble, Mother Mary comes to me speaking words of wisdom, let it be. And what had happened was his mother had come to him in a dream. Her name was Mary, and it was a tough time. And she said, it'll be okay, Paul, let it be. And that's where the song comes from. So I started putting these songs of, or songs where people got them in less than five minutes, where the song would just suddenly download into their head quickly or spontaneously. It would just, they would just stand up and sing it and had never practiced it or done anything like that. So it was a very bizarre sort of book that was written, but it's the same thing, I think, as in ufology, that ufology has all these different angles of, it's not just UFOs, it's phenomenology. It's all tied together, doing the psychic phenomena, the dream. It's incredible, isn't it? And it's this consciousness element that seems to be pushing the envelope to the next level. I yeah, and that, yeah, and that came down to what I came to the conclusion. I had written a book called Inspired, where I looked at not just musicians. I looked at artists, I looked at Nobel Prize winners, inventions, stuff, and it was all the same thing. And basically what it came down to me is the ability to shut down the left rational analytical brain and use the right brain, which is the brain that can tap into this field, whatever you want to call it, the Akashic Record of the field or higher self or whatever you want to call it. It's able to do it. And musicians are very right brain. They can shut down that left rational analytical brain. And that ties in again to ufology. If you look at the uh, research was done by Dr. Roger Lear, who did the implant research, he was asked of all the implants that he did, 17 implants he took out of people. And they said, what's common between all the people that you work with? And he said, they're all right brain creative people and Hollywood is full of them. And number two, all implants are on the left side of the body. So people are talking about these alien implants that are put into their bodies. He said they're all on the left side. And that makes total sense because the left side of the body is run by the right brain. And so you get this very direct connection that experiencers seem to be sort of very right brain creative people, the same as musicians. So it is of no surprise that musicians fall into this category where you have a high number of experiencers, a high number of having UFO sightings and this sort of stuff. Whereas when I did a lecture to a very major golf course in the United States, I tried to find just for an opener to that lecture, I tried to find a golfer who had had a UFO experience or an abduction, and there basically was none. Now that's interesting. Yeah, but if you do musicians, you put musicians, UFO sighting, your screen will absolutely light up. I mean, it's, a, it's just unbelievable how many have it. it there's, it's not a rare coincidence. It's extremely common. So Grant, your book is out and about. Can we get it on Amazon? Yeah. Great. Give us your website and contact details, and thank you very much. Okay, uh, my website is presidentialufo.com, and from there you can link to my Facebook, to my YouTube, and to the Amazon, and I also have a publishing company where we try to help experiencers, sort of help them show them how to publish their book, which is called It's All Connected, which is basically the bottom line to the whole thing. It's all connected. It's all the same thing. How fantastic is that? Thank you very much. That is superb. Thank you, I would just like to add a little rider to that. I followed up on the only uh, left brain implant location, and Daryl Sims is of the opinion that it isn't actually only the left, uh, the the left brain where the left side where you find the implants. It can be the other. It's just that the majority seem to be there. And uh, apparently, he spoke to Dr. Lear about it, but Dr. Lear had somehow run with the idea that it was only. Um, and I would like to, this also brings me very nicely into the album cover, which uh -huh. is a take on the Sergeant Pepper 
uh, album cover, but instead of the, the Beatles and all those guys, it's me and all the people on the album, as well as some of the good and the great of the, of the UFO world. And I think it was a stroke of genius. And the creator and experiencer is Dan Vallely. And uh, I, he also did the CDs, which are beautiful. Now, at the moment, <clears throat> until the CDs, uh, the downloads really sell, there's not any physical CDs available, but the album is out on 90% of all the uh, online platforms like Deezer, iTunes, Amazon, Spotify, Bandcamp, all, of, all the rest of that. But they are absolutely beautiful, and you can see them also on the uh, website, the Eclect here website. Uh, so that's really fascinating. And what I wanted to go on to say just before we, we played the grant um, clip was that about how it can change your character, these interactions. And the way that Chris described this to me, I thought was fascinating because he said he comes from a hunt and fishing country, you know, and it's normal for, for the guys to go out shooting things. I can never get my head around that. But anyway, um, and he was known for shooting one of the biggest bears in the area. And uh, one of the things he says now uh, is that he cannot do that. He cannot bring himself to kill another creature as as he used to. He said, it, you know, he doesn't have the heart for it. In fact, it almost, you know, upsets him. And, and now he has developed uh, an ability in painting. And also he kind of looks after creatures and, and the land. And, does a, and I hope that Hollywood are going to make a movie of his life. I know it's uh, on the cards, but I hope that comes out because that, his story is exceptional. Absolutely amazing, um, incredible stuff because it also involves his whole family as well. And as Grant said, he's also had an experience with Chris at Chris's home that was of a paranormal uh, nature. So... It is interesting how the interaction with ET tempers the soul, tempers the personality, helps to bring out generally better, more um, developed and higher faculties uh, and makes those accessible. So I'm not saying it's for 100%, but it does seem to be for the people I've spoken to. And it's not that everybody, by the way, either has a great experience um, with the ET scenario, there, there's plenty of things that are experienced which people find very traumatic. And in fact, going back to Chris Bledsoe, just as a case in point, because I've just got his soundbite. He's not a musician, but I've got his soundbite on there simply because he talks about the messages in the music and what is this album about. It's about a bridge, creating a bridge between this field and the general public who may be interested in the X-Files factor of life. And this certainly, you know, it gives them quite a bit. Um, and it's just that Chris, you know, very openly flags up that you know, things are different now for him as a person. And, and I'm sure it's the same for his family. But, um, yes, he also said that he had five years of trauma and difficulty, fear. But he worked through that, uh, was able to work through that. And uh, come out the other side, a bit like Jim Sparks will say the same thing. The guy, um, you know, his incredible experience. And it took him you know, many years to come out the other side and to see these experiences differently. It's often very uncomfortable for us. And, you know, Grant was mentioning Whitley Strieber there. And, and again, listening to him again recently, he's come out the other side of it as well. And a lot of people perceive this interaction as another level another awakening level for humanity um and maybe it's us in the future maybe it's another layer of us who knows exactly what that is but certainly it's something that gives us food for thought and joanna you you know uh, when uh, barbara played the grant uh, cameron uh sound bite uh, you and Grant were talking you know, a little, little bit, bit about uh, you know, quite a number of uh, musicians uh, by, by name, Ace Freely and Neil Young. Yeah. 
uh, mm-hmm. Mike Pinder, uh, you know, uh, when Merle's with us on Tuesday, uh, you know, we can get into uh, the discussion he and Mike had. But um, it, 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 with the you know, wide diversity of musical uh, genres on Eclectia, you, you have reggae and some sitar, heavy metal, you know, piano, concerto, classic rock, native flute, techno yeah, music, uh, yeah, 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 just a little bit of you know, wide variety for you know that would appeal to any uh, listener. It, 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 did the? I'd like I'd like to think there's something for everyone. It, yeah, you know, and, and yeah, you know, I, I I really do think that is a a good adjective to use to describe the CD. And, and do, do you think that those artists that had a good experience had their abilities or? It became a broader experience where they may have ventured out into yeah. learning to play a sitar and, uh, or some other instrument that they normally wouldn't. Be oh, um, you know, I, I couldn't say exactly or specifically yes to that, but the fact is that it opened up in them definitely. I mean, I don't know if you have the. Um, uh, Gary Williams uh, soundbite and song, or the Gary, uh, sorry, the Greg Fitzgerald. But um, so Gary Williams, for example, in 2009, he had a profound sighting. And what I mean by uh-huh. using the word profound there is that it entirely rewired his brain because he wasn't thinking about this kind of thing, not interested. And he and a friend observed this in um, a place called Luton not a million miles away from the center of England uh, with a friend. And they could not believe what they were seeing. And all he could think about, you know, he had to write a, a song about this. And I think it's, it's one of my favorite songs. I love all of them, but that's just, oh, I love it. And his soundbite telling you about that, it, I think that's really great. And, um, and then Greg, Greg Fitzgerald, who's uh, got a real, real lovely poppy song, is uh, and he's done some work on production, by the way, with people like Kylie Minogue and Madonna and stuff. So, you know, it's got some great people on here who've had a lot of experience in the field of music as well as this. And he was saying that on his soundbite, and I, again, I can't remember if you've got that one. I've got to look at what I sent you. Was um, that it, it? It seems to like Grant says it just kind of downloads, and there it is, and then you've got your song. So. I, I guess it does absolutely light up those parts of the brain and, and the areas of interest for you or your particular focus or, you know, it, it's incredible. It really is amazing. And of I think all the people on the album have been inspired by and affected very much by their experiences and, uh, Gary was saying um, actually before I tell you that what I would like to say is that Doug Degnin, Dougie Degnin um, he his contribution to getting this album out there is incredible and I couldn't have done it without him because I was also working full time and, and still do and she, you know I was up till 4 and 5 a.m. after you know 12 hour shift sometime or more and you know he'd be working with me and we'd come over or he'd come over and then we'd be working till similar hours again get really you know getting this stuff done and he helped with a lot of the technical formatting of it and assessment of it and it was absolutely fantastic and he had an experience as a child and there's Mike Oram who also had a childhood experience about the same age four or five years old and Doug's was, Doug said that he was somehow, although he, he didn't say there was a being involved or a craft, he said it was as if there was something coming to him from this light as he happened to be out in the garden as a little fellow of five years old. And he felt that what was downloaded to him was the understanding of how the universe 
worked and that it was all an illusion. And he said that now we are coming to the point where we can choose to remain within the illusion or to break free. And he said, I think we're in that time now. And his wonderful song is called Another Good Thought. And don't thoughts create things. So the reason I wanted to flag up Dougie was because he had battled in even the year. We became very, very close good pals. I think, you know, he's probably part of my soul tribe at one point or is part of my soul tribe because uh, he was also um, had a very difficult time. He became an alcoholic for 10 years and gave all that up in, 2000, uh, in 1993. I mean, and what credit to that soul to go through that intense experience to be out there admitting it and talking about it if necessary or when relevant and then to move forward into the spiritual realization and to move into helping others. He became a a drug and sexual abuse counselor Um, that got a little bit dark. He said, so I had to come really come out of that, but he was just moving with compassion on helping, helping people. And during the year, he had uh, T-cell lymphoma issues. That was sort of, they were checking to see whether the cancer was benign or not. Um, it turned out to be okay or benign. And then he had a horrendous physical condition to deal with, like a psoriasis, but extreme. And other conditions just kept coming on and coming on. And, you know, bless him. We worked through all of these, these times and, you know, uh, he, he was he was incredible. He was a real anchor for me. And then we released the album on um, November 30th, and it was great. We finally birthed it. And then a month later, so he had a month. He we we spoke. Um, I last spoke to him on the 23rd of uh, December, and on the 20th he said, "Oh my goodness, for the first time I can listen to the album without my techie ears on, and it's great." I'm really, really enjoying it. You know, what a wonderful thing to contribute to the world. And uh, then on the 23rd, I was going up for Christmas to family and friends. And uh, he clearly wasn't doing very well. He'd slipped a disc in his back. He was in a lot of pain and stuff. But um, then on the 28th of December, I got a message saying that on the Christmas day, Dougie had suffered a massive stroke and had... Uh, gone into a coma and on the 28th when I had this message from Simon Young who's best friend of his and who's also on the album uh, he said yes sorry to uh, give you the news this way but they'd switched the life support off and at 1.16 a.m. on New Year's Day Ducky left he'd had enough the body had said you know what I can I can't hack it anymore (laughs) in the physical I'm going to help from the other side, which apparently is what he is doing. So, yeah, we lost a good pal on the physical plane, and um, I'm still coming to terms with that a little bit, but he did an amazing, amazing job. So isn't that incredible that he, you know, and he said to me once, he said, Jan, you know what, I think you're really saving my life. And maybe, maybe for some of the time in that year that happened, (laughs) not that I was aware of it, but bless him. For that you know we've got another good thought would you like me to play it oh wouldn't that be nice let's do that here it, com- here it comes Much fun. Throw 
blow the blues away Happy all the while And that's another good song That will ride around the world tonight Another good song Another good song Another good feeling That will satellite the satellite That was a good one. Yeah, great fun. Great fun. What? Yes. Sorry. Uh, 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 go ahead. And, uh, if you want to do a follow up to uh, Dougie's song, go ahead. No, I, w- I was just going to say, um, you know, so all of, all of the people that have contributed, you know, I, I think it's all really powerful and I mm-hmm. think they're incredible for. Also, putting their own little sound bites on and together, which um, I really wanted to do because I think when you hear the power of somebody's voice, not just in song but in the spoken word, then it, you really feel that resonance and vibration from them. And so that is what is so lovely and one of the unique things about this World First album. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, you really did have a great idea with a you know, song followed by the songwriter. Uh, discussing how he or she was impacted by the event. And it just gives you, uh, you know, just more insight into the person. It's, I think it's, it just brings it home, doesn't it? It just yes. makes it real. It anchors it for the, for the person listening. And, you know, I know it's not like your standard album, just a whole lot of music, which is all the same similar genre, um, but this is this mix up, this mash it up, I, uh, uh-huh. I love. And with Dougie, we were planning on volume two of Eclectia, because uh, it is an eclectic mix, as he will say. And you can see Dougie and I talking, uh, doing a little brief bit to camera on the Eclectia website, which is um, the etnewsroom.wixsite.com, and it's a forward slash Eclectia release, bit of a long one. But anyway, you can find it uh, there. And uh, we're just talking, we've been working all night again, (laughs) and uh, we just sat down to to recap where we were, and it's September the 6th, because we were saying, oh yes, it's my daughter's birthday today, so it was a memorable day, when we finished all the tech stuff. We still got a lot of stuff to do before the release, and getting, um, we had some some of the CDs uh, copied so we could send them out for promos and what have you as well as the um, 
you know, getting the download system sorted out. And uh, it, it was just lovely that we had got to that point. And, you know, I found a note in an old journal that it was it was the 13th of March that I'd spoken to Dougie. It had to have been at least the month before because I'd got an email saying, thank you so much for letting me be part of this amazing project and uh, which, you know, he made it amazing too. And, uh, but it was, it was, it was only about nine months that this whole thing was, was brought together by, I must say some Herculean efforts at, <laughs> at times, uh, but it was, you know, we did have a, a lot of, a lot of fun and not too much of the tetchiness either. We, we actually did, <laughs> did really well but uh yes it's a, a shame that uh i've lost dougie to the 3d um simply because he he had also come up with a great idea which was his which was this idea of a kind of band-aid kind of song where there'd be one song written and the the band members would would you know sing it and it would one of the things that's close to my heart and in Dougie's heart was I've wanted to create a hardship fund for a long time for the experience of field because I've spoken to quite a few people who, you know, having profound difficulties with health, with whatever. And if they're in America, it's very, very difficult, a little bit easier here because at least you have the free health care. But, you know, still difficulties, mainly financial difficulties and not being able to access resources, health, or, or, or even a proper roof over your head. Anyway, so, you know, and, and then you've got the ET stuff going on as well. So, uh, and also, you know, maybe paying for treatment therapies, that kind of thing. So there isn't a fund for that. So I'd wanted to, to set that one up. And um, from all sales, as and when they all, it all takes off, the, apart from every, you know, the musicians getting their cut, the, there'll be 10% from the album going to this, hardship fund and then Dougie had thought that if we do this album this one song then all the proceeds could go to the hardship fund and I could not come up with an idea for a, you know a, a nice name something that didn't sound horrible and needy and you know <laughs> uh, socially not not too great uh, for the name of the fund and you know hardship fund sounds awful and all the rest of it but anyway so when I lost Dougie, of course, that idea is still is still there. I've always wanted to do it. But it's now going to be known as the Dougie Degnan Fund. So he's given us the name, <laughs> bless him, for that. And as for the song, I'm not quite sure where it's going to go now because Gary Williams picked up that baton and ran with it. And, and just before we lost Dougie, he was able to play him a little bit of the, what he'd worked on that, thus far. And Dougie said, that's it. That's the song. That's the one we're going for. And so Gary had gone away for a couple of months now and worked on it. And I think he's just come to uh, the point where it's completed. And he said, I can't believe it, Joanne. I've never been so if you can, rerouted from his normal musical work to this. But he's also doing it for Dougie. So I think one or two of the others um, on the album are going to be part of that song if, if that works out and mm -hmm. how, how it all goes out there. I'm not quite sure, but I think that's what we'll be doing. And well, most of it uh, will, uh, Gary will be getting something for the song and, you know, the rest will be going to uh, more or less the rest will be going to the fund. So let's hope that spins off as well, because we do, we do need to, you know, to support our folks here. We need to, mm -hmm. you know, we all we all need support, but you know, especially when you've got fringe issues going on, and it's very difficult to to speak to someone about it without them, you know, wanting to section you or get the psychiatrist in. You know, it's very hard, and it's it's nerve wracking. I I had a lady call me recently. She was in, absolutely in tears, and she just said, "I'm not mad. I'm really not." And you know, we had a long conversation, and I'm still in contact with her about a lot of things that are going on for her um, and some very difficult, um, you know, and um, so it, it really challenges us, these, these different realities or these parallel realities, however you want to reference them. But it's very exciting too. And as I said, it's, uh, it, it's, you know, being at the sharp end at the cold face of it all, is where we're all at, where you guys are at, where I'm at. We are helping to, you know, share this and create this bridge of communication 
and hopefully kindness and understanding that even if this is not your experience, then, you know, open your heart and at least go, well, okay, I'm going to put it on the back shelf. And if something comes up to validate that, okay, I, I can accept that. And if not, then let me just leave it, leave it be. You know, I, I also can't believe everything that I hear, but, you know, let's at least be open because maybe it's real for them. And maybe my understanding is not broad enough yet to accept you know, what they've been through. So, you know, we, we, it's very hard for us not to judge. And I put my hand on my own <laughs> heart for that one. And I have to catch myself and pull myself up and say, okay, that's, that's not the kindest way forward. And, but and I jo- think uh, it's important. Uh, uh, Joanna, since you just mentioned, um, you know, we need to have more of an understanding of, you know, what other people have uh, gone through. Since, since you uh, are a uh, regression therapist, it, it, do you see any patterns e- emerge from those who have been contacted, had these experiences uh, you know, during the uh, Grant Cameron um uh, sound bite. He, he uh, dis- discussed a little bit about some of the artists uh, were told okay, you're going to be a musician. You're going to get the message out even before the uh, you know the future musician was even born. So, do, do yeah. you see any uh, kind of patterns emerging with some of these people that almost seem like? Uh, they, they were chosen for this lifestyle. The, it's it's very common to find a, a generational link. It's not always the case, but very frequently the case. And like this lady I was speaking to, she's a, a rhesus negative B blood group, um, and that's not uncommon. I think uh, Butch Witowski uh, and the ICAR. Uh, uh, organization that he set up uh, do quite I, I don't know if they've done an up-to-date one I haven't I'm not up to date with to speed with him uh, and his work but I, I know I've looked at this blood uh, research survey that they did and I can't remember if it's seven or 17 percent of the whole planet is, is a rhesus negative but either way on the abduction scenario or maybe stroke contactee it's something like over 40% are rhesus negative. So that's an astonishing number compared to the global population blood type. So um, I'll have to uh, look at that again to get definite figures, but it is in that region. So it, so clearly there's, there's an interesting thing, and also about the blood, the negative, uh, rhesus negative, was that it, it isn't as old as the positive blood i.e. they were saying that there isn't evidence of it, and I can't remember how they came to that conclusion, beyond 25,000 years ago. So it, it doesn't that pose an interesting question or a, a series of uh, thoughts about was it then that interaction be, really began or was it way before and the positive is also part of that? I don't know. I'm, I'm a positive. <laughs> I haven't had any one-on-one direct um, uh, encounter. Actually, you know, I think I'm going to say that I was going to say that I haven't had. But um, let me recount really quickly just an event that happened since I started the Amash project. I've had some very, very bizarre um, happenings, uh, occurrences, um, fascinating and also challenging. And this one was just interesting. So I was in my my room, and my room is about, my my bedroom, I guess it's about 17 or 18 foot by about, say, 12 or 13, something like that. And um, it was quite late. The room was was dark, and I was just sitting up, finishing, you know, putting the lights off or putting the alarm on, whatever. And I noticed as I began to lay down that in the center, so I was wide awake, in the center of the room, so that would be, you know, maybe from the bed, it might be eight feet, 10 feet away from me. I noticed a sort of, um, 
almost cig- cigarette smoke kind of fug, foggy fuzz mist arising. And I thought, that's strange. Am I seeing that or is it my eyes and it's the dark, you know, and I'm tired? <laughs> anyway, it wasn't because out of that manifested immediately a man, a human being. I mean, I would recognize him on the street. <laughs> this is about two years ago. I call him Clive. I don't know why. It just seems to suit him. <laughs> it's not that he told me. And he was dressed in gear that I described as 1960s, but I'm not. I stand corrected. It's actually 70s. And I'll tell you why I, I corrected myself. And he he was sort of a strawberry blonde hair, hair and he had a, what we call a, I don't know what it's called in the States, but like a tank top, a, a sleeveless um, woolen vest over a shirt. And uh, looked like he had black corduroy trousers on, or dark brown corduroy trousers on. And he was—he gave me a slight smile, and with his right hand, an open palm wave. And I thought, well, how, what, how bizarre. And the researcher in me kind of kicked in. I thought, oh, okay, what's going on here? I'm not feeling anything. I'm seeing something. I'm not smelling anything. There's no contact telepathically. It's just this smile, and then he faded away. I thought, what the heck? And then, right beside me, was this, I, I only saw the arm, because I didn't feel I wanted to look any further, but it was an arm of some kind of large insectoid. And it, you know how when you have your hand just bent, your hand bent over a human hand, it goes over at 90 degree angle to your wrist, right? Uh-huh. Unless you're double jointed or you've broken your hand, it does not go down to the arm, okay? So right. this being's very long, claw-like uh, hand was right down on its arm. And I, and I couldn't see if it was like a pincer or, or whether there were fingers there and it was just all bunched together. And it was... I, and if I had to give a name to it, I'd say it was a mantis, only because that, uh, from all the pictures I've seen, I would say it, it kind of looked it. I didn't see the rest of the body. I didn't care to look up. And again, everything kicked in like, what am I seeing? What am I smelling? What, you know, what's going on? Nothing. And it faded away. It just went. And I thought, oh, my God, what the heck was that all about? What was Clive doing smiling at me? Uh, what was, was he? I mean, I didn't recognize him as anybody I knew. But I tell you, if I saw that guy in the street, I'd go, oh, it's you. What are you doing in my bedroom? <laughs> and about a week or so later, possibly two weeks, but anyway, I had a call from my girlfriend up north of England, about 300 miles away. She said, I had, <laughs> I had a man in my bedroom last night. I said, oh, lucky girl. She said, it was Clive. I went, what? I told her the story. I've only, I only told one or two people before I tell the rest of the world. <laughs> and she said, and he wasn't wearing, he wasn't wearing 60s gear. That's 1970s. And she is the detail queen. She has, she could tell me every last detail of his shirt, his ne- the collar on his shirt. I mean, really, I, I'm a good general girl. I, I get the detail if I need to uh, on occasion, but otherwise I get the global view. And um, and she said, yeah, he had the dark brown corduroy trousers on, and but but he didn't wave or he didn't smile. He just appeared to her. And um, <laughs> I said, did you get anything? Was there any communication? Smells? Like any? She said, no, nope, that was it. He kind of came and went. So now whether that was just to confirm for me that he he was he had been seen elsewhere. <laughs> what I don't know what that was if anybody else knows, but it was very friendly. It was all very kindly. And, um, and the creature beside me, whoever that was, there was no sense of fear or terror or anything. It was curiosity. What the heck is this? And I don't know whether they were testing me to see whether, is she ready to see this? It can, you know, is she going to freak out or, but no, I, I mean, and I'm sure that if a mantis or, well, I don't know, I'm sure I, I would think that after all I've seen read people I've spoken to that I, I wouldn't be freaked out, but you never know. It depends on the energy with which it comes. I've also had extreme experiences where there's been malevolence, which has not been pleasant. And every fiber of my being has had to be brought to bear to keep me safe and to keep um, the energy and to clear the energy. So gosh, yes, it's been an interesting journey for me. 
and <laughs> eclectia is where it's brought me to which is a beautiful thing a beautiful thing of love and uh light i hope and jo- joanna uh, we just heard about your mantis uh story and well i surmise it's a mantis you know uh, I, I just can't think of another creature it might be but it you know hey ho okay um <laughs> But there, it, it, there is uh, a sound bite that has uh, a, a description of a visitor to Mike Orham. Oh, and, honestly, uh, that is amazing. The Mike, Mike Orham, folks, is um, is an English experiencer. Oh my goodness, his story. He's written a book called "Does It Rain in Other Dimensions." It is. Phenomenal. He spoke at my very first Amash Project conference. Um, wow, this guy's story is astonishing. Uh, let's hear the soundbite, and then we can we can talk a little bit about him okay. and the portable portal. Do that. My earliest experience was back in 1955 at the age of four, when I told my mother that something of incredible importance was going to happen on this planet that would affect all units of consciousness, whether it be mineral, vegetable, animal or man. I told my mother that this would not happen in her lifetime. She did die some years ago now, but it would happen in mine. All these decades later, I now believe that what I was trying to say is that there is an energy coming into this solar system that would give people the opportunity to ascend to a higher frequency. After this, I started to see who I now call my space brother, his name is Telosh, who visited me throughout my life. At one time, when I was walking along a country lane near where I lived some years ago, he appeared beside me. A portal opened up on the other side of the lane, and I was given the opportunity to go through this portal and go back home. I decided to stay as I wanted to continue making people aware of this change of frequency. He said if I stay I will suffer intense pain until my passing. Since then I have developed a degenerative neurological condition that leaves me in severe pain 24-7. Telosh only comes to visit when it is absolutely necessary to give me a message or otherwise. Oh, that always has me in goosebumps. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, uh, what did Mike Orham experience? Is, is this something similar to what you and your friend from the North um, experienced? Oh, no. Is this no, is not, something not different? All. Oh, yeah, completely different. This, this was okay. his brother. This was his his buddy. This was uh, an E.T. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and as he said, this portal just opened up in the road where he was, and he was told he could go home. But, you know, he he knew, a bit like Dougie knew, that this was a time of choice, of great choice, and the frequencies on the planet being very different. I, I really feel that myself now. And, uh, uh, you know, he wanted to stay. And, you know, I, I said to him, you know, Mike, I, I'm really cross with these other guys, these ET guys, you know, because... How come they can't, you know, how come you have to be in pain? Why can't they clear that? Why can't they heal that? And I, we don't have an answer for that. But I, I would really rather like to know. And just quickly going back to Chris Bledsoe, Chris Bledsoe had for many years chronic Crohn's disease. And toward the end of 2007, really just was at, at his, his wit's end and wanted to end his life because he couldn't take the pain anymore, because he'd been bed-bound with it. And when he had his encounter in 2007, they completely healed his Crohn's disease. And so he's free of all that, but now he has some rheumatoid arthritis, which he attributes to getting too near the craft or the orbs or what have you. And again, you know, same question to these guys. Okay, you know, if we're place-holding things here for you or the, the experiences are, how come we just can't deal with this pain issue? But if you take it a step further on a consciousness placeholder, 
for energy kind of idea. Maybe Chris and maybe Mike are holding the energy of their pain, you know, bearing it, if you like, because it's part of a cosmic consciousness that if they do that, then it will be somehow serving the world. I'm not sure. It's a philosophical question. Okay. And since, you know, know, we just heard a little bit about healing, uh, consciousness, uh, awareness. Oh, the portal portal I was going to mention. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, okay, good. Uh, Go ahead and talk about that. And I I can come back to my question just when when you're done. We can get into another uh, soundbite. Yes, let me know who you got got up next and I can link into that for you. So, um Devara. Oh, Devara. Oh god, this is amazing. Oh, the one of the few women, two women on the on the album myself and Devara. Do Devara. Oh, she's amazing. I actually interviewed her in 2013 at the International UFO Conference. Oh, what an extraordinary woman. But anyway, let me I'm digressing. Let me uh just continue with a portal mm-hmm. portable portal so um some people uh don't think that this is is possible don't think that this is a reality and i know that sixto paswells because i've had quite a few chats with him uh, through interpreters and with him uh, over time uh, about how uh, in certain parts of the earth there are natural as he calls them zendras portals and uh you know due to the magnetics due to whatever and due to you know these guys these these other beings they can create them and it's no problem and i believe our military can do it no problem and uh the reason i believe that is because uh if you read mike's book you'll hear this extraordinary story of how he and his partner were visiting the states and they've been around area 51 and and little ailey inn and all those and he'd had an incredible um experience um, an encounter but this but one of them involved the military he believes and they weren't too far from area 51 and during this event he saw what looked like military bring in this um now i'm trying to do, remember how he described anyway this this um piece of technology and he believed it was a portal a portable portal generator because he said he then recalls that he was suddenly in another you know environment let's call it and he is you know really sure about that and you know uh, again you guys should have some of the people from the eclectic album on and hear some of their stories because they are uh, absolutely extraordinary and newsworthy even even today when i say even today because you know, these were people who've had experiences from childhood. And as Mike says, you know, that was in 1955 he had that um, a, um, experience, that soundbite, um, you know, when he knew things were going to change and there was going to be something different on the planet. But his mother wouldn't see it, but he'd see it in his lifetime. And, and he, uh, I, I guess, is um, mid, mid-60s mid now, something like that, maybe late 60s. So that it seems that this time, right here, right now, is when the magic is beginning to unfold. And I say the magic because there's there's normally a little bit of chaos around magic. (laughs) And I use the word very broadly. I'm talking about the the magic of our consciousness being us accessing it ourselves rather than it being, um, you know, impeded upon. And um, anyway, going back to the portable it's not the first time that i've heard that so they can be created and they can be a portable piece of kit like these military had as well so you know it's it's a wonder this whole field and when you think as well what's been kept from us for the last 70 or more 80 years Gosh, and what they, you know, deep state know, and I don't just mean the states, I'm talking about the UK and, and other developed countries, like the Russias and all the rest of that. Uh, you know, what is known? Wow. And when that becomes revealed, bit by bit, we'll be astonished, no, no doubt. It's like the cell technology, the SEG, the Tesla technology, uh, you know, all, all of that will come to be. And the wonderful Canadian John Hutchison, that fantastic maverick uh, a scientist who you know went to 
the uh, where was that the Gulf Breeze spill and I know I'm going slightly off topic here but just showing how wonderful these people are who are working with these fields he took himself off at his own expense with a friend and went and worked with sound working that's what I want to say sound and frequency breaking up this massive oil spill and when he asked the the the, uh, the government body there for a boat to go into the center so he could work from there as well, they denied him. As they denied people like Kevin Costner's ocean cleaning uh, patented um, system and many others who went to the aid. It was just Cheney and his Halliburton company that used their poison on the waters to clear up the spill. So, <laughs> oh my goodness, we, we do have the ability to move forward in major leaps and bounds and I think that when the time comes for that to happen that um, things will be in place to support um, the experience of that okay and you, know, you just spoke a little bit about healing the uh, planet and people and uh, mm. you, you know, you're uh, leading us into um, little discussion about the desert southwest and Sedona. So, uh, Barbara, do you want to get the... Yeah. yeah, uh, Let's get that little sound clip uh, queued up and uh, we have about 20 minutes left. Thunderbeat, is that what you want? Yeah, that's right. Dwara? Okay, here it comes. Hello, this is Deborah. Thunderbeat. Since the age of four, the beings from Sirius have contacted me throughout my whole life. They work with color, light, and sound frequencies for healing and to activate you into higher dimensions. As a musician, this is the work that I do on all my CDs. My CDs are actual healing tools. I also use sound frequencies for my rainbow body activation sessions. You may sample my music and books at etsandangels.com. Blessings, everyone. Devara's Devara's story is also pretty extraordinary. She said that also when she was uh, that same age, she was out in her yard and this beam for a tractor beam from a UFO was taking her up and her mother saw it and came to hold on to her child and take her and they were both taken. So mother and child have some, you know, extraordinary experiences, but it's wonderful. I mean, it's a bit like um, um, Grant was talking about the Moody Blues and Dave Pinder talking about how they were going to come down and be musicians and do these kind of songs and and she was going to come down and do this healing music. And it, it's fantastic. It's absolutely beautiful stuff. And I think that when we, you know, color it with our passion and our integrity, that, you know, all of that gets translated through in the frequency. And I did some wonderful um, work and, and experienced a, a gentleman, an English gentleman called Sir Peter, known as Sir Peter Guy Manners, uh, he, he died a good few years ago now, but I, uh, way back when, I did a couple of interviews with him uh, about his cymatics work. And cymatics is all to do with sound and frequency. And he would show me how he could have sand on a plate and he would point the frequency to the plate of, say, the Crab Nebula. And guess what? As he switched on the sound, the sand would take on the shape of the Crab Nebula. And what he, he had, uh, he had a clinic at, um, in Evesham at Bretherton Hall, where he lived with his wife, Maria, who was a radionics expert before uh, uh, she went, bless her. And he, had, um, he would treat people there and he had a pool and he would fill the pool with vibration and frequency uh, of various kinds. Because what he's, cause I, I'd say to him, well, Peter, you know, if your liver is, has an issue, how do you know if everybody, of course, everybody has a liver. So what happens because everybody's slightly different? How do you know 
what frequencies you're going to use for the liver. He said, oh, he said, there's a, a harmonic for the liver. And we just put the whole harmonic through. So, you know, wherever you are in that range and frequency, your liver will respond. I said, wow, of course, that's great. So he was telling me about an elderly lady who was wheelchair bound, came to the clinic a few times, and she came in to have the healing waters. And he said, I can't remember how long it took before she was able to walk to her wheelchair. Because <laughs> it just goes to show you the power of sound and frequency. And I remember I turned up for filming one day with him and I sprained my wrist and it was really painful. And he did a, a cymatics treatment on it. And it was incredible. It, it really disappeared almost instantly. And he was also telling me about one of his clients who had been working in Germany and had sustained a very bad industrial accident, sort of tearing open the whole of his, one of his hands. And it was extremely serious because he might have lost the use of his hand. And he had told the, the German um, uh, medic team that he would come back in, to England. And they said, but, you know, they were very worried because, you know, it was a real potential that he could lose movement. And he said, no, I'm, I'm going to work with um, Peter Guy Manners and uh, on the cymatics. They said, oh, you'll be fine then. And he got full use of his hand back in six weeks. <laughs> Absolutely major, major trauma and injury. It's amazing. Wow. So I'm going to be doing, um, I only, it, it, you can see on my YouTube channel, which is, uh, I think, the MASH Project Stroke ETN, um, those two short interviews with him, which are for, uh, very old now, but, well, they're very old. <laughs> I did them a long time ago. But I always wish I had recorded his life story because he told me one time that he was not from around this neck of the woods. <laughs> And I can tell you, he was a very unusual person. And uh, he told me he was from Venus. I said, oh, okay. This was years and years and years before I was ever doing my uh, mash work or anything. I was still quite open. But because it was so far from what I knew or understood, I really put some of that stuff on the back burner and thought, okay, let me see if there's going to be any validation <laughs> for this. So anyway, there's a couple of people I know who knew him at the time, either through me or through other uh, auspices. And we're going to do a documentary about this man's life because it's linked to the Spanish royal family in ways I won't discuss at the moment. But it is off the charts extraordinary. <laughs> so uh, anyway, work to be done. <laughs> so it, or, or, or the... Experience, you know, experiencers um, ha having these encounters because of some of the locations. Uh, you know, Devora said she was in Sedona. It yeah. seems to be a hot spot. You know, of course, you get you know Stonehenge. You even have uh, you know one of the pyramids on the cover of. Uh, eclectia, you know, uh, yeah. is how, what's the role of locations with some of these encounters? Well, it is an interesting question, but you know, I know people who've moved house many times to avoid such things, and it never works. So I, I don't, you know, mm -hmm. there are hot spots, and I think there are hot spots for various reasons, and I think it can be geographical as well as to do with power, to do with water, um, and you know, maybe bases as well. Uh, but also, um, I'm not sure that, uh, I think there is some argument for location, but uh, but that's not the whole story because, as I just said, people have moved that I've spoken to on, you know, occasion and not just once or twice. And this uh, scenario follows them around. And it, it, it seems to be that um, there is something for the soul to do to learn, to go through, and whether there's a certain strata of humanity who are preparing the rest for, with an understanding, maybe at a subconscious level, uh, bringing it, percolating it through into the conscious, so when whatever triggers, whatever consciousness, hundredth monkey level is reached, we kind of go, oh yeah, okay, yeah, I knew that, 
<laughs> I, just today I was talking to someone who said, you know, you couldn't have said that three years ago even and, and got any positive response. I, I forget the actual point, but it was to do with the consciousness and the, the level, of, the speed at which things are, are, you know, manifesting and developing at this moment seems to be uh, extraordinary. Um, and, and it's very, very interesting, all of that. So I, I, can't, I can't say definitively honestly, whether location is the thing, because I know it it can happen at locations specifically, and then it can change. So uh, I, I don't think there's a definitive answer, but someone else may know better than I do. I haven't had that come up as a point. What I have come up as a point is that people, uh, and more than one person I've spoken to, have had to move. Um, and it's interesting how clearly governmental forces know about that, you know, know of those people who are having experiences that they have an interest in as well. So hmm. curious okay. and curious. Sir. Okay. And since, since you just mentioned the government, uh, you know, it seems like most governments say they don't exist, but, but, uh, some governments are becoming a little bit more open. So, it, it, are you noticing that with uh, you know, the UK, Canadian, and American governments that? Uh, yes, I, I think I think a little, but I think I think they're also managing it because they know they can't keep a lid on it maybe as well, because I do think that the groundswell is gaining, gaining ground of um, uh, acceptance of this subject. I can't remember. I I was on a a morning TV program uh, three or four years ago and they, they'd done a poll and there was a phenomenal percentage. I think it was 60 or 70% believed in UFOs and all the rest of it. I mean, you know, for the for the general public, I'm just going to call use that term. Um, I think there is an awareness on the peripheral, whether they're interested particularly or not. But you know, they'll they'll have heard of a UFO. There's, there's virtually nobody on the planet, you know, in the developed world who hasn't heard the term, doesn't know what you're talking about in that regard. Whether they're interested is another matter, as I say. But so I think that um, I think there's a lot of management. Let's put it like that. And, you know, I mentioned earlier on about the spin and the infiltration. There's been plenty of that. But I think now there's so many credible people. And the the swelling that, you know, it's like a massive sea of information that has, you know, this tide coming in, like a tsunami even, of information and experiences. And more and more people are becoming courageous enough. And you've got the people like Snowden and all the rest of that, um, who, who clear, and, and, you know, very credible people who have moved past on now, but have left their testimonies. And you, you can, you know, we cannot say that all these people are crazy. Otherwise you'd say, you know, well, maybe I'm crazy too. I don't believe that. <laughs> oh, so I, I think the mental health issue, uh, generally speaking, is not applicable to, <laughs> you know, the experiencer field that I'm not saying that there aren't any people with mental health issues, don't get me wrong. I've spoken to one or two who are experiences as well, but um, that's another matter. Okay, uh, Joanna, we're coming down to uh, 10, 10, 11 minutes left. Uh, yeah, we have um, um, maybe a couple more uh, responses, and we need to give you time to. Um, I'll plug all, all your websites and where people can get eclectia. But um, you know, if we look at um, say one of the songs like "Alien Agenda," uh, what do you think the agenda is? Well, that, that's an interesting one because it's uh, by Pete Nelson. And he's a, another uh, Canuck, Canadian, fellow Canadian. I was born in Canada, <laughs> raised in the UK. 
And um, I spoke to him about this because I've interviewed all the uh, um, non-UK folks as well to talk about their songs and stuff. And he and I said, it sounds like, you know, that, that this is, you know, you, there's some malevolence about what the experience is and that this is, you know, quite hard hitting song. He says, yeah, you're right. It, it is. It is. And, you know, nothing wrong with presenting another side of the coin, right, for those people right. who feel that. But guess what? He said, I don't feel like that now. So often people, you know, th- this is uh, often this kind of interaction can be, and it's not always by any miles, but can be very disturbing, very challenging, and all those things that humans find difficult when it's not in our you know, usual frame of reference. Um, and I just thought that was very interesting too, because um, I've had some very interesting people, you know, connect with me. I had this, <laughs> um, I had a documentary that a, a, a very well-known company called Channel 4 in the UK made a, I'll call it a mockumentary. All integrity went out the window when they took a hand in it. Um, the original people who pitched me for it were lovely, and I do think to this day that they would have maintained some integrity. But unfortunately, when you get the big boys on board and they're the ones who will distribute it or publish it, etc., then all integrity went out. And um, I had one or two people, I so said that was in 2013, but I had about 300 emails from people saying, you know, yes, it was a, a horrible talk. <laughs> Entry. But, you know, thank goodness for someone putting their head above the parapet. Thank you for doing that. Because, you know, it, it's bringing the subject into light. And thank you. I don't feel so alone. And this is another thing that I want to do. A lot of people feel very isolated and, you know, scared to talk to, you know, definitely will not speak to a medical person because guess what? The NHS and those kind of people like over here, they already are primed in the psychiatric department and, and all the rest of that. You have to be very careful if you want to talk uh, to, to any medical person. I, I've, there's one interview that I've never put out and it's um, a gentleman who does have some mental health issues and I don't want him to have any other issues because of, of this. I may put it out one day, but um, he said to me that one of the reasons that he went down the psychiatric route for help was because there was nobody else to speak to. There wasn't an Amash or the ETN. And, and still, people don't know. You know, they sometimes find me by accident or somehow. So it's still not really well known that there are bodies and people that they can speak to and not feel afraid, not feel vulnerable and exposed. And, um, you know, and I said to him, if you'd have had somebody to speak to, would you have gone the medical route? He said no. But now he's so far down the psychiatric medical route that he will not, you know, he cannot um, manage without. Uh, um, and that's just the way it is. And, you know, there's another person I know who is on some medication and that is enforced. They said, if you do not take this, um, you'll be sectioned. And he is, a, you know, another English experiencer. Um, and so you have to be very, very careful and cautious how uh, you unfold it. I forgot the point of the question. I'm sorry, at the beginning, but I've also spoken to parents of children who've had uh, experiences and one of them who, who'd actually I'd forgotten she'd, she'd met me some some years prior had got a child and her child was clearly having experiences and her husband was going absolutely nuts saying do not talk to anybody we will have our child taken off us because social services certainly in this country don't seem to need any excuse to remove a child from its parent and and also you know then who knows what happens to that child down the line it's dreadful uh, you know, the consequences thereof. So, um, you know, I was uh, planning at one time to set up a, a family parent and child uh, counselling and programme uh, in which parents and children together in a safe space could um, explore what the child was going through. And wouldn't that open up the world to uh, another layer of this? Because we all know it happens because most of the experiences I had experiences as little ones. I mean, that's recorded, that we know that because they tell us. So, um, but, uh, you know, that didn't happen because uh, I was roundly attacked by um, 
somebody who says they're an experiencer with children and says you can't do it if you don't have children. What? <laughs> Does it mean I have to, you know, burn my hand to put it, you know, put it in the fire to know what it's like to be burned? I don't think so, of course. But um, it's very interesting. There's lots of layers to this field. And um, I would just say if any parents and children do want to speak about it, uh, confidentially, you know, you're very welcome. But um, I'll, maybe in another year or two, I might put out a program for parents and children in the UK and test drive it and see how we go. But I think it's vitally important that, you know, children are, children's experiences aren't brushed under the carpet and it's only your imagination. What if it's not? So anyway, the, you know, I just wanted to flag that up because we don't talk about that in this field much. Right, but uh, it, and it's a valid point to make. Uh, you know, it is just, indeed. Yeah, you know, you know, we've had a comprehensive view of the whole phenomenon uh, th this afternoon. It's, um, <laughs> it, you know, uh, that needed to be uh, brought up as we wind down the show. So, you know, we have... Uh, it's just a, interesting. Yeah, uh, and we have about four minutes. Do you left. have any other soundbite that you want to uh, put out before we finish up? Um, I've got Daniel Valley. Uh, oh, Valley. Oh, I tell you what, that's a wonderful one to play if I think we, we do have time. Okay, because let, it's we so gotta squeeze it though. We we gotta squeeze it. Squeeze it. Okay. okay. I'm breathing in. When I was two years old, I floated through a closed kitchen at window, smothered in a warm, suffocating light. I was pulled up towards the shape, like my spinning top, surrounded by three figures in silhouette. I was dizzy. I felt like I was spiraling down in a bottomless helter skelter. My name is Daniel Fallaly. It's now 50 years later and these experiences have continued throughout my life, shaping my reality and at some point connecting me to the universal consciousness. I learned that everything is connected. And Dan also has an implant, which is on the Eclectia, can be seen on the Eclectia website in the gallery page. And that's extraordinary because he had a stroke when he was in his early 40s or mid 40s and was in hospital for a week before anybody said anything to him. And then when he approached the nurses and the doctor came out and said, oh, yes, you have had a stroke. But what we're really interested in is the artifact in your brain. <laughs> and and then when he went back into his room he just happened to have a private room for some reason he's put a thought out to who knows et ufos or whatever and just said if this is anything to do with you guys give me a sign show yourself and guess what ufo in the distance past his window <laughs> and daniel vanelli is our fantastic graphic designer comic illustrator and musician on the album as well so for those of you wanting to find Eclectia I'm afraid I can't send it out in the physical form at the moment but you can download it from nearly all the uh, major online sites as I mentioned or platforms like iTunes, Deezer, Spotify, Bandcamp etc etc and um, on the uh, website the Eclectia website you can find out, you know, more of where those sites are if you're not familiar with those and see a little bit more about what's going on. And some of my interviews are also on there if you've a mind to look at those. But the Eclectia website, it's a bit of a long one. I know I mentioned it before. I, I don't know if it'll come up with just Eclectia, but you can try. But it's the ET Newsroom, wixsite.com forward slash Eclectia release. And the ET Newsroom is literally the etnewsroom.com. I haven't done any updating on that for ages, so excuse me if some of the pages are not quite as they should be. <laughs> I need a webmaster, and I need... <laughs> I could do one or two people in giving me a hand here, but... 
Anyway, I hope you've uh, found it interesting today. And don't forget, if you guys want to hear the extraordinary story of Bill Brooks as well, um, and his book's called 44, based on a Nick Soldier's true story of uh, lifelong alien encounters and abduction. That's on Amazon as well. And uh, he made me put based on simply because he, as we got to publishing, he got very scared and wondered, you know, he needed a bit of wiggle room to feel comfortable. (laughs) Bless him.